see a little red dot somewhere. Awesome. There you go. Welcome everybody as you come on in, um, feel free to say hi in the chat real quick. Um, love to know who everybody, where everybody is, where everybody's coming from. Or if you don't want to, that's okay. Clara's here. <clears throat> Sarah, Sarah, I'm coming to Kirksville in a couple weeks. I need to send you a message. There's Anne, Carolyn from Germany. Wow, that is some dedication. Hi, Karen from KC. Hello from the UK, excellent. <clears throat> we have a couple more minutes for people to come in. There's Roseanne, see lots of RC Missouri names here, loving it. and RC from other places names, which is great. We love that too. <clears throat> I hope the weather is nice where everybody is. It's Super nice here. So I've shoved my child out the door to play with his friends. So that's who I was waving to earlier. If anybody sort of noticed that they won't be in the way, hopefully. <clears throat> okay. I'm going to turn off the chat real quick. Hello, RC Missouri members and guests. My name is Stacy Davidson, and I'm the president of RC Missouri. It is RC Missouri's mission to celebrate and share the cultures and histories of Egypt from the ancient through Islamic periods with Missouri and its neighboring communities. You can stay up to date with RC Missouri news and events by following us on Facebook, Twitter, or by accessing our website. Although both RC National and RC Missouri provide free public outreach events, some lectures, workshops, and benefits are restricted to RC members. If you enjoy RC Missouri's programming and would like to be more involved in our organization, visit the Join RC section of our website. At registration, make sure to select Kansas City, Missouri to affiliate with our chapter. It is my pleasure to welcome you today for RC Missouri's first book chat, which features Dr. William Carruthers in discussion about his recent book, Flooded Pasts, UNESCO, Nubia, and the Recolonization of Archaeology, published in 2022 by Cornell University Press. We will have time for Q&A at the end of the conversation. Please type your questions in the Q&A box and you should find that at the bottom of your screen in that panel of buttons. I would like to thank RC Missouri board member, Dr. Kate Shepard for hosting the event as well as moderating the event. 
And without further ado, let's extend a warm RC Missouri welcome to Dr. William Carruthers. Perfect. Thank you, Stacey. Um, <laughs> welcome, Will. Um, okay, uh, just to introduce everybody to Dr. William Carruthers. Um, he's an honorary lecturer in the Department of Art History and World Art Studies at the University of East Anglia. He's held fellowships from the AHRC, the Goethe Henkel Stiftung, and the Lever Lever Hume Trust. I always stumble over that one. Um, and has been funded by the European Commission as a Max Weber Fellow at the European University Institute in Florence. He's the editor of Histories of Egyptology, Interdisciplinary Measures, and of course, we know um, Flooded Pasts, uh, this one right here. Um, I also would like to add that Will and I were both associate editors for the Bulletin for the History of Archaeology for several years. Um, and I don't even remember when we first met. I was actually trying to remember this. And I think um, it was... It, circa 2009. Was maybe, it really? Maybe. Uh, okay. Somewhere in London. Was it um, at that conference that... Um, was it, it was Amara and Gabe had put together? I It was prior. Oh, maybe. wow. Okay. You know, it, it, it was a while ago. <laughs> it was a while ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we just keep running into each other. Um, so we're going to do just a little conversation. I um, have some questions for Will. And of course, as the as your questions come up, um, everybody attending um, comes up uh, in the chat. So hopefully we can, or sorry, in the Q&A. So hopefully we can get some of those. <clears throat> but basically, I want to start off with you telling us um, what Flooded Pass is about. Okay, um, and thank you uh, to you, to Kate and Stacey for this. It's very nice to be here. Um, I don't often get a chance to do this kind of thing. You know, they let me out occasionally. <laughs> um, uh, right, so Flooded Pasts. Um, it's basically, I am, a, how, how best to describe this? I'm sort of a recovering archaeologist. And what, what this is, is, is it's a history of archaeology. I became a historian of archaeology and a historian of science. The book is like a long durée history of the entanglement of um, irrigation work in Egypt and Sudan, mm -hmm. and the way that became entangled with archaeological survey, uh, basically. So, you know, there have been large scale irrigation works, uh, particularly in Egypt, for over 200 years. Uh, it's all part of the modernization of the Egyptian state. Um, now, at some point, um, those works, I think, you know, archaeology was always somewhat entangled with them. But at some point uh, in the late 19th century, uh, there's a decision to build when the British have occupied Egypt, there's a decision to build the Aswan Dam, uh, which sort of ultimately, as the dam is heightened a couple of times, um, leads to a large scale archaeological survey in the region to the south, which is Nubia. And so... Um, the book sort of chronicles um, how and why that happened, the sort of pasts that it's privileged, the way it sort of created a situation in which the population of that region, which is to say the Nubians, whose identity sort of coheres through this process as well, ultimately are sort of ignored uh, and are shunted off to become a sort of item of ethnological interest. So alongside the Aswan Dam, which is heightened, uh, I think they start building in 1898. It's heightened around 1911 and then heightened around 1930 again after Egypt has gained nominal independence. Um, in order to get Egypt into a state where perennial irrigation is possible so that the country's um, agriculture is no longer dependent on... Um, the sort of annual inundation of the Nile, which is dependent on rainfall in Ethiopia, basically. Um, there's a decision uh, which is made ultimately, it, the, the plan starts in the 40s, um, while there's still sort of a lot of British interference in Egypt. The decision is ultimately made under the free offices in the mid 1950s to build the Aswan High Dam, which of course becomes uh, sort of emblematic of um, Egypt and NASA in also the Cold War, right? And and sort of NASA's position within the globe. So the high dam is built. Um, 
the the flood uh, behind the dam is going to be higher, longer than any flood before. It's going to destroy mostly everything in its path, uh, which includes the remaining Nubian settlements and also the remaining archaeological remains, ancient temples, ruins that are in this region. And at this point, also, the flood for the first time enters Sudan, which became independent in 1956, right? Egypt, sort of, there was a revolution in 1952, um, after Suez in 56, the British are kicked out finally. So, you know, these are two newly independent countries, right? Um, so the UNESCO launches a campaign to save these monuments and archaeological sites. So the vast majority of the book, at least I would say probably five chapters, concentrates on how that came, campaign worked, but also, again, what its longer-term histories, genealogies are and what the consequences of that work have been for how we think about, uh, in particular, not only archaeology in Egypt and Sudan, but also this region, Nubia, and the people who lived there, who were ultimately displaced. There were several, at that point, there were forced migrations um, about 30 kilometers to the north in Egypt, near Komombo, and then much further south um, in Sudan to this region called Kashim al girba right? So these are sort of notoriously didn't go all that well quite quickly and there's lots of discontent today surrounding that which has sort of only grown really but the book ultimately is about how the sort of the vision of nubia the archaeological survey and archaeological work in general in countries like egypt and sudan helps to create allows that that displacement and a particular vision of the Nubian past to come into being. So it's about how that is laced with sort of ideas about race and scientific racism. It's about archaeological expertise and who gets to have it. It's about what happens when you work in certain places. Um, and it's in general about the multiple really colonialities of this work. And you have to bear in mind that until 1956, we're talking about not just Sudan as colonized by Britain, but we're talking about the, the Anglo-Egyptian Sudan. And there's sort of a dual for the historian Eve Trout Powell has discussed this. I think she calls it triangulated conquest. There is a sort of dual colonialism at work there. So it's really about Egypt's relationship with Sudan too, and, and how that affects both these countries coming into being as contemporary nation states within the multilateral system which we see unesco is one embodiment of obviously the united nations in general is the most notable embodiment of so the book sort of ends on a it's sort of a pessimistic account um I guess that's just my modus i guess um the book the book ends on a sort of slightly more hopeful note by asking what the future might be, what the role of archaeology, of any, within that is, and, and really sort of tries to discuss and think about ways in which Nubians themselves might start to gain authority over this past, which is something they've never necessarily had, whether they should even, you know, they even want a role with archaeology those kinds of questions so it's it's you know it's about in that sense the changing nature of expertise as well i guess okay. um, have i <laughs> have i summarized what i wrote there i think so uh, I mean, yeah now, that was that was fantastic <laughs> thing a million times um yeah I, I can no longer bear to read my own prose yeah Just no i I feel you. I think anybody who is watching us who has written, I think anything probably feels the same way. Um, yeah. And I'm glad that you, well, you mentioned the history and philosophy of science background, because I think your PhD mm. is in HPS, right? From Cambridge. It is. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's pretty, um, yeah, I was thinking about how to talk about this. I mean, it's pretty central. I think, you know, I'm not, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm, I'm guessing no one here wants a potted history of the history of science, but I think one of the, one of the big questions for the history of science too is to what it defines as actually being science. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, archaeology occupies a sort of complicated place within that 
definition that has traditionally been used in that it's a very marginal um it's sometimes seen as an interesting thing to study because it can make claims to both being a humanities subject art subject and a science subject right so i think approaching it as someone who was sort of trained in hps but is also sort of marginal to hps a lot of the time um having it despite you know you know i've published in like hp a history of science journals whatever but just it's still a marginal topic i think um i think the most important um sort of thing that that background brings to this work is um so there's a very well-known historian of science called stephen shapin and he wrote a book at some point because it what oh god what is it it's like so, an heard. account of science as, it's never as pure. If it was yeah. done somewhere with people with you know, things you know yeah um kate you've frozen so have you <laughs> can you hear me hello what's there, we yeah, go. there you are yeah. there you go yeah so did you manage to get out the title of the book that i've sort of half remembered uh, yes i'm cause... looking at it it's on my shelf it's never okay you pure. should read it out. yeah it's never pure um I can I can grab it. Hang on one second. <laughs> okay. Historical studies of science as if it was produced by people with bodies situated in time, space, culture, and society and struggling for credibility and authority. So there you go. That's that's basically, I think, a good summary of, yeah. the, of what HPS brings to this. It's really yeah. about thinking about <laughs> histories of archaeology have tended to be um, traditionally sort of great men histories. They've tended to be histories of ideas too. Bruce Trigger wrote a pretty mm -hmm. well-known intellectual history of archaeology. There's a second edition of it. It's massive, you know, and, you know, when you're taught as an undergraduate, at least the history of archaeology, at least when I was 20 years ago, you're taught about ideas and you're taught about sort of fairly logical progression of ideas and what the history of science i think allows you to do is not to think in terms of like progress and a sort of pretty linear account of progress but about mess and the actual practice of of a discipline uh or a, a set of disciplines in this case because this is you know one of what i think one of the things the book also should show is that it's not archaeology egyptology are not sort of um these isolated disciplines um their definitions are not simple they are linked to all these other disciplines that are happen you know happening taking place in Nubia so there's a lot of architects there's engineers there's geologists all these things are sort of mixed together uh in a place that is sort of not an easy place for a lot of people to work uh that involves hundreds and hundreds of people who you would not necessarily think of so you know archaeological sites tend to get linked to the name of the person who's in charge of the excavation and obviously what we now know and now talk about quite a lot in terms of what actually happens at them is that especially somewhere like egypt sudan they involve hundreds and hundreds of other people doing the digging work um yeah this is like a massive complex process um that is not at all linear is a complete mess is still being worked out decades later in the case of nubia because a lot of this material is still being published um and it, it's it's about how people it, it allows you not only to think about that sort of mess but it allows you to think about how people create authority and authority figures out of that i guess and these forms of expertise these um sort of basically sort of authoritative narratives about the past which in the case of nubia is pretty sort of you know another one of these instances where you get this sort of inexact idea of ancient egypt i guess is what really comes out of this even though a lot of like these these ruins are like um a lot of the big temples become churches there's a lot a lot of them were sort of greco-roman foundations in the first place there's like hundreds and hundreds of years of history here 
But as a result of the sort of, you know, tourism too, what you actually get is this nice tidy image of, of and you know, tourism is a long-term thing. And I discussed that. There's lots of bits in the book about sort of traveling up and down the Nile and how that helps to create this image of Nubia as a basically like desolate Nile side place without any people. Um, but it's about the process and the practices that go into making that, I think. And it, and it allows you to sort of, it's it's like you, you you've got you know it allows you to zoom in to quite a fine scale and look at how this is working at like the level of a grain of sand sometimes i think or a pot shirt and then zoom back out again and have a, a much sort of easier easier overarching narrative but it's really it's it's about mess yeah i think and and people and things and not even necessarily people but yeah. things like the wind, animal, I don't think there are animals in there. They probably could have been, but I think the wind makes it in at some point. Well, in the water, I mean, yeah. obviously. Yeah, I mean, ultimately the water, yeah. you know, I should probably be much better about saying I'm an environmental historian or something. But, <laughs> but well, yeah, the it, water is fairly central. <laughs> it, I mean, it's interesting, too, because as I was reading it, I, my PhD is in history of science, too, as you know, Um mm. And so when I do, but I also have a degree in Egyptology. So when I do these histories of Egyptology, which is what we're doing, um, it's also, um, it's not, obviously HPS gives you that, that all of these other things, right, that we need to look at that. It's not that Egyptologists maybe don't do that, but they're Egyptologists who write the history of their own discipline, it's it, they're going to look at things in a different way, right? They're going I, I to think just look at different you, stuff. Yeah, I think it lets you. It's it's reading the material <laughs> slightly askance, you know, really, mm -hmm. and that's uh, it's basically what it allows you to do. And again, and I think ultimately, it's it's a methodological thing that's really useful. Um, I wish <laughs> more histories in the field of archaeology were, were written that way. They're not. Uh, it's a shame. Maybe increasingly they might be. I think there's, you know, it, it, it there's there's more and more interest. I think in sort of STS methods. Um, leaving aside for the fact that STS is sort of a different thing, maybe, but you know, like. Science and technology studies are, are there, they're happening, and this material, I think, can provide, re I mean, it's it like all sort of history of science stuff, you need to know sort of, a lot of people in the history of science emerge from the field they end up writing about as some form of, um, it's like they have a professional disconnect with it, or they have like a professional I don't know how to describe it, but this happens quite a lot. And, you know, there's, I think, I couldn't, I mean, maybe I could write about the history of physics in a certain way, but, you know, I feel like I at least have a grasp over a lot of this material anyway because of my initial training, and that helps. Um, but I think ultimately as well, the big questions for the book, for me, what, you know, it doesn't, the, the HPS literature is in there, it doesn't pretend to be like I don't see it as a major contribution to HPS. I see it more as a contribution to the history of other stuff. I think because I think the questions it raises, many of which are sort of ethical. You know, it's about how archaeology has treated local populations um, in, in collaboration with various other sort of forms of power it seems to me those are sort of the the more necessary questions to be engaged with and i think you know hps at the moment sort of is trying to do that mm -hmm. with its own work but it's also it's again it's got quite a funny relationship with that kind of approach i think at times and, and um this will be the last thing I'll say about HPS, mainly because I could talk to you about this forever. Um, but yeah, I, I thought it was interesting when you talked about sort of being marginalized um, 
the history of Egyptology or archaeology being marginalized in HPS, because I totally feel that. Um, but then also um, going to, you know, publishing in an archaeology journal or, you know, presenting at an Egyptology conference um, is also they're not really accepting, you know, those kinds of abstracts or whatever, where you say, you know, I think I'm gonna really dive into this sort of story and look at, um, look at questions of, of gender in public speaking about Egyptology, you know, like that kind of stuff. And it's like, I think, I think in both ways, uh, sort of in both fields, it's like, you, we're kind of, you're kind of hitting the edge of both. Right. Yeah. Um, and it's, and it's this whole, Kind of brand I, I feel like I have to spend a lot of time explaining myself to a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. People basically, yeah. and it, there's like an extra step there that you sort of have have to make a lot yeah. of the time. And I think it's sort of got easier. I think you know one thing so. that is genuine with this sort of material. One thing that's genuinely changed is you know, obviously, uh, the repatriation issue has made it incredibly like live mm -hmm. um so it becomes you know i think it's just it's around more and makes it easier to discuss but also then there have been moves within all these disciplines to sort of try and shift a bit whether or not they have done yeah. you know the last year of tutankhamun commemorations suggest they I might not have done those. it i know you love them <laughs> you think we need more uh, well, that's um, that, my your words, not, not mine. Um, uh, yeah, I you know it does make me think. You know, it, it's no matter what you do, you're sort of people are caught actually, you, you know, in a sort of contradiction. Um, where if you want to dis, you know, you discuss that material, you end up discussing age old stuff, mm -hmm. and the best thing to do would be possibly just to forget all of it about it <laughs> that's also clearly never gonna happen is it so yeah. um it's it's a catch-22 yeah um, I think um okay so let's see there's this I love I I really like this book it's super complex um it's not obviously as as we've kind of talked about this sort of straight history of Egyptology or even a history of the Aswan Dam or whatever. There's so many things. So I'm going to skip ahead in a couple of the questions um, because you were kind of talking about this environmental history part. And <clears throat> throughout the book, you make statements like water made Nubia, paper made Nubia. Um, that's really, I think, where the um, where your HPS background was really right. like kicking up, um, early standing out to me. Um, so what do you think was the strongest force that made Nubia? That's a really good question. And like, obviously, I've seen these questions in advance, yeah. uh, at least some of them. Uh, and I like, I saw that one and I thought, oh, God, do I really do that that much? And I do, don't I? It's fantastic. Um, it's great. But, you know, I don't think all you, there's no strongest force. Right. Okay. Um, and one of the things I should have maybe made more of in producing the book and actually writing about it for things is there's a lot in here about paperwork. And, mm -hmm. and archives, archives and the yeah. fact that, that archaeology is like a archaeology egyptology are inherently like paper-based disciplines there's a there's a lot of paperwork that happens both sort of literally in the field and in sort of office like environments either there or thousands of miles away as the stuff is being published mm -hmm. and it's really about how you know, and I guess this does go back to sort of HPSE stuff, doesn't it? Because, you know, Bruno Latour wrote that famous paper about scientists. I can't remember what it's one of those Latour papers about scientists making diagrams and inscribing yeah. stuff. Uh, and that's really how you, in the end, convince people of your work mm -hmm. um, and its importance. And, you know, that's what these fields are about, too. There's this vision of them as being like these rugged sort of um sort of outdoorsy um things which to some extent you know people are running around outdoors in the searing heat and, and doing their work um often for not very much money <laughs> money mm -hmm. um but at the same time they're doing paperwork right and it, and it and it's about 
how paper makes these visions cohere, but at the same time, none of this would have happened without irrigation, without the Nile. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and it, it, it's one of these things that makes the idea of Egypt as the gift of the Nile seem like a reasonable thing to say, I think. You know, it it creates, it helps create that idea. Um, you know, which I think, as, as Timothy Mitchell has said, is in like almost all development reports about Egypt feature this yeah. mm -hmm. at this point. Um, and, you know, this is just like another instantiation of that in a sense. I mean, you know, it's like a long term um, sort of example. And obviously this is um, especially in the 1960s when UNESCO are involved, this is all entangled with the politics of you know the rise of development in the world mm -hmm. this is the this is the un's development decade right um kennedy launches it in sometime in 1960 i think and you know the us is one of the major funders of this work anyway this is this is a very long-winded way to say that i don't think any of these things by themselves make nubia but together mm -hmm. they all help make it um you know equally you could say the same thing about pots i guess or you know material culture in general mm -hmm. right not just paper but yeah. um paper is one of the more central things um and they all make it and you know i don't i i don't always subscribe to the idea that everything has to be socially constructed but you know, there's what these people are dealing with when they dig stuff up, and when they deal with water, is something physical and real um, that's there that they can see and witness. Uh, and quite often, paper, as I go into, um, helps people elsewhere witness. Right? There's um, again Steve Shapin, but uh, wrote a book with this other well-known historian of science called Simon Schaffer, and they they come up with this phrase, virtual witnessing. And virtual witnessing means the production of a form of reality uh, that allows people who can't see it to see it elsewhere. Essentially, does that? That's about what that's about. Um, you know, so in a book or something, um, and and you know, that's really what what's happening here. There is they're dealing with physical stuff, but there are ways that physical stuff can be made more real um and made into something that people you know social construction doesn't mean something that made is made up it means something that basically people socially have agreed upon is the best fit or exists or is the authoritative explanation for something and that's what's happening here right yeah um so yeah <laughs> again that's a very long-winded way of saying all these things help make nubia yeah um, real and exist in people's heads, whether that is in Europe, North America, Egypt, Sudan, in you know these countries take various forms. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, do you mind if I take a question from the audience? This is Sarah Orell. You all, you two might know each other, I think. Um, so Sarah asks. Uh, can or should a parallel be drawn between the late 19th and early 20th century approach to indigenous Americans as a vanishing race and the ethnographic approach to the Nubian people? Um, she said, I'm thinking particularly of Robert Fernie's Nubians in Egypt, Peaceful People. Do you, um, that's can you a really see good that question? question. Yeah, 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 I can see it. Okay. Um, thank you. That's a really good question. Um, I don't know because one thing is by the sixties, by you know these these ethnic. So basically, those in the sixties, the Ford Foundation um, in Egyptian on the Egyptian side of the Nubian border sponsors an ethnographic survey, as it's called, uh, in collaboration with the American University in Cairo. The mm -hmm. Faneers are involved in that. On the other side, on the Sudanese side. There are ethnographic surveys that are sort of sponsored by the Sudanese Antiquity Service. And there's also a well-known account uh, by Hassan Defala, who's like one of the Sudanese district commissioners uh, for the Wadi Halfa region where the Nubians lived. 
about the resettlement, which sort of takes again, it's sort of like an ethnographic approach, right? Um, and these things take a fairly functional, applied um, approach to what they're doing. And I, you know, I don't, in a sense, I don't want to belittle or that work <laughs> because I think it's sort of, they are a lot of the time doing their best to sort of create the conditions in which a large number of people can move. It's, it's very, but they're coming from a very specific place and viewpoint and it's sort of builds on these decades of um ideas about nubians that have sort of already sort of are in place mm -hmm. so it's sort of i i think what happens it's not you i mean with none of none of this stuff can you ever like say you can never draw like a straight line i think that says oh yeah this is like is basically the embodiment of this thing that happened 70 years ago but what you can say or 70 years previously what you what you can say i think is that you know it's it's within the trajectory of the set of ideas that developed and it, those things clearly have some form of influence and you do see the nubians being treated as an object basically um you know it's i think I'm going to preempt one of Kate's other questions, which is about sort of salvage and, and rescue yeah, and, and the use question. of those words. And, you know, there's a whole tradition of salvage anthropology. Someone has a book out about that at the moment, don't they? Um, Sam Redman, is that right? I will look. Um, you know, and salvage is never, like, it's not, it's not a neutral word um and you know it's it's quite clearly linked to forms of colonialism and ways of of treating local indigenous populations um that are basically racist right um and so by salvaging the nubians even with the best of intentions, I think it's like almost impossible to have escaped that sort of thing. And at this point in the Cold War and the rise of modernization theory, the word salvage is imbued with those sort of connotations, um, you know, sort of a globally uh, significant sort of concept. Because, um, you know, a lot of a lot of the stuff around dams, archaeological survey, I, I guess, you know, ethnological stuff too is coming out of the like, Tennessee Valley Authority, things like that in the interwar US. Um, you know, so these concepts, it's sort of partially about how they move around the world at this point. And these are all like American anthropologists. Well, that's actually, that's not true. They're not all American as Egyptians. Um, maybe even some Nubians involved. I can't quite remember. Um, but it, it, you know, it's about how these sort of ideas concepts move around the world as practices and i guess what the sort of um the actual consequences of that are and i think the consequences are that nubians are like sort of treated as almost as sort of native survivals but the other issue here is how egypt for instance treats its own sort of marginal populations um you know there are sort of ideas of race develop um you know they're not just european ideas they're not yeah. just north american ideas they're egyptian ideas um and it, this is really an issue of how all these ideas sort of act upon this population who are in a part of the egyptian a very marginal part of egypt essentially and one whose border has never actually the high dam helps to solidify yeah um before the high dam the egyptian sudanese border as it sort of was was porous obviously the flooding the creation of a huge reservoir behind the dam that floods everything means there's suddenly a pretty thick well, not entirely but pretty fixed border there bits of it are disputed um and it's really about 
how all these things come together to um, treat this marginal, this really, really marginalized population who remain marginalized um, in the decades afterwards and still remain marginalized. Um, you know, the latest is that there's um, since, you know, the early 2000s and particularly since 2011 in Egypt, um, there have been growing calls for a Nubian right to return, whether or not those calls really um, emerge into anything solid is, is a sort of another question. So you have a situation where basically a population is treated poorly as sort of third best, you know. And this is, you know, I, it's not the only case in Egyptian history, you know, Egypt's border areas, this is, a, again, happens. Um, so, um, I, you know, I don't want to draw straight comparisons. I want to sort of, I guess, put this in a historical trajectory in which these ideas are moving, essentially. Um, and it's, again, it's sort of, I, you know, like the sort of, you know, coloniality is probably a better term okay. to discuss it, um, just because it it lets you get a grip on, you know, you don't just bandy around colonialism, you get a grip on how those ideas have sort of continued or not to be relevant. And, you know, in the case of like the UNESCO campaign in the 60s, there are some very clear instances of how like all the things did continue to be relevant, most notably because you have committee members who are running this thing, who are like involved in older survey work 30, 40 years before, right? There are very clear linkages, but at the same time, there are these more complex relationships. Um, and that's, I think, what gets sort of difficult to discuss in a way. Um, and, you know, that's, I think, why a term like discussing their coloniality is probably a more useful way to think about it. I mean, either way, the upshot of this is that the Nubian streets incredibly poorly um, continue to be in a lot of cases. Um, yeah. Uh, and it sort of remains to be seen how that plays out, I think. Let, let me sort of come into the end of that too because uh, and this is at least in my mind the way that you are answering this is this is slightly connected so um the last question that i have so in chapter five how you're talking specifically about um egyptian archaeological labor um and especially the group known as the gufties and they're still famous and they're still highly sought after um for their skill i know that breast i'm I mean, going back um, historically anyway, Breasted was using them in, in um, Palestine, right? In the 30s, like he specifically asked for them. They were used them. all over the region, I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, so <clears throat> this, this is kind of part of it too. So I want you to expand a bit more on, on this coloniality, right? And why doing more than just mentioning uh -huh. Egyptian expertise is, is crucial for this kind of discussion. I mean, okay, right. And I think there's like an interesting like historiographical point here mm -hmm. in that it's become very popular um, to mention um, Egyptians, to mention the Guftis mm -hmm. um, as doing all the work. It's sort of almost become a get out clause for people, I think. Um, but it's it it sort of rests. I mean, people have been doing this since at least the 50s. I found examples where people have been, oh, and by the way, they did all the labor, it's not us. Yeah. Um, I, I think a lot of the more recent stuff, material on them, um, rests in probably Donald Reed's books, mm -hmm. which sort of create a very comprehensive account of archaeology in Egypt and how it excluded Egyptians. Uh -huh. Almost create an opposition I think sort of un unwittingly almost create this sort of um, opposition that's sort of been impossible to do much with. Yeah. Analytically, um, which means what the one upshot is it's, you know, it, it's like 
we'll write Egyptians back into this history, which which is great, mm-hmm. right? But at, at, at the same time, it's not a very sort of complex, sort of critical way of thinking about this and thinking about other forms of power relation, like, for instance, Egypt's relationship with, the, with Sudan, mm-hmm. um, or how in terms of um, groups like the Guftis, um, how dynamics, you know, even between them and the laborers they were working with and overseeing actually worked. Yeah. Um, I know Wendy Doyon has mm-hmm. her PhD deals with this in a lot more detail. Um, and you know, it's it's important to think about. I think the various levels of agency and power and asymmetry that actually go into making uh, these archaeological relationships. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not just a clear cut us and them sort of uh, relationship, which I think very often is how it started to come across it, both in the literature, but also you see this in exhibitions quite yeah. a lot. Um, and again, there's sort of this get out clause of, well, if we just like have, we mentioned some, <laughs> we just mentioned some Egyptians and have uh, one information panel in Arabic, that's fine. And, um, you know, in terms of like this book, you know, Arabic is not even necessarily going to be the most relevant language to Nubians who yeah. <laughs> speak any, you know, number. Um, it, there are all these sort of complexities that I think have got in recent years, as there has been a move to doing this historical work, have sort of got skimmed over quite a lot. And I and I think it's sort of important to rethink how how that is done and how it's happened. And again, this is. I don't, you know, I don't think twenty years ago, um, things would have gone that far. Yeah. Um, necessarily, but then again, who was really writing the history of this stuff twenty years ago? I don't know. Um, you know, and it's it's just there is there are layers of complexity here that if you want an actual useful. I think, yeah, useful, historically useful account of what happened really need to be addressed. And a lot of that, it's really quite difficult to address it. <clears throat> Partially, yeah. this is like an issue of w- what material there is, who has access to it, who is allowed access to it. For instance, it's much easier sometimes for me having written this in various like connected to various european institutions Mm -hmm. to sort of come in and look at material if i feel like it i can move around the world i have been able to move around the world and within egypt pretty easily yeah gain access to places that i know other people haven't been able to gain access to um yeah, because you, I mean, you talk about, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you were talking about the problems of the archive. I mean, you open the introduction with that and then you talk about it throughout. Um, and so, um, you know, I sort of, I like to do these kind of categorical, what do you think the biggest problem of the archives <laughs> is, right? I mean, access is one, but like, what's what's another? Mm-hmm. I mean, what are these problems? I mean, because I know you talk about them and you you detail them, but I would love to hear you talk a bit more about them. I would say there's like sort of three major issues, one of which is what the archive for like the history of archaeology actually is. Mm-hmm. Not, you know, there's, there's a temptation to say, well, it's archaeological archives, isn't it? But it's not just archaeological archives. It's a whole lot of other material because as ever, archaeology is taking place in the world. It's not pure from of it. You know, it's there's a back and forth between archaeology, popular culture, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, Mm -hmm. right? One other problem is the way, and I'm not the only person to have discussed this clearly, Christina Riggs has done it uh, before, uh, in in, actually in relationships to Carmoon, and you should read her work because it's the best work on it. Um, 
it's about how these archives were organized in the first place, which is to say, like, it, as you know, I know how archaeological archives are organized because I like worked in, in creating them at times, mm -hmm. I guess. But at the same time, coming in as a historian, you become aware, oh, yeah, these, these, these are archives that are organized to help the people who are using them on a day to day basis. So what is it these designations and these categorizations are concealing? Um, what is it they're they're helping to make possible? And again, sort of what are these sort of layers of expertise, that kind of thing is assisting. Mm -hmm. um, the other major issue is like in a in a in Egypt, for instance, um access to some archival material is either impossible or so heavily securitized that it may as well be. Um I had access to the documentation center as it's known in the Nubia Museum mm -hmm. do so you know I spent like a couple of weeks there sort of just combing through what is a substantial amount of material but frankly I think the fact I got in is entirely luck yeah or the fact that I am me <laughs> um you know I I don't think other people have been allowed in um it is unclear it's i think officially closed oh wow um i somehow got um you know the letter of um permission to do this work mm -hmm. others have not been so lucky and again i have like it is very easy as someone coming in when i was writing this book with resources with nice institutional affiliations in europe being a man probably help you know it, it it like it made my life easier yeah um i think it's not even necessarily i mean some of this material is in arabic but that's not even necessarily the biggest issue right hmm. um again it allows you access to more material to have the languages but there's just sort of all these overlapping issues around archives that go into writing and researching something like this that I don't think um are necessarily taken account of um yeah. in you know in wider historical writing they are I think in terms of like the history of archaeology specifically that they're, they're not necessarily I mean some people do but certainly not everyone um, and then I'm fairly, you know, there are sort of working archaeological archives still. I'm not even sure I'd be allowed anywhere near. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, you know, it's, there are all, you know, so what you're writing always, I make no claim that this is a, um, a complete account of this work. It is an account of it that... Mm -hmm. I managed I managed to put together based on what I saw mm -hmm. um and that's what I mean that's the other thing I I I think people there's you know talking to archaeologists who I think often you know they write site reports they write very comprehensive reports of their excavations that are published years later often um, you know, but they are meant to be quite comprehensive. The difference in writing history is that it's it's not comprehensive. You're writing, in a sense, a creative account mm -hmm. of something. Um, and that's, you, you know, of something you think to be true. Um, but that's that's what this is. It's the account I could write based on the time I had and the work I did, right? That's it. I'm not. I, I'm not. I'm not here to like answer, <laughs> you know, whatever archaeologists had for breakfast. I do that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but you know what I mean. It's it's yeah, like do. that's not what I want to write. Yeah. Um, and that's not what anyone's gonna get who reads it. Yep. Um, and I'm sure that could be written. Yeah. Um. I'm not going to do it. Well, um, this I was mean, this was enough effort. Yeah. 
But I mean, that's that's exactly it, right? It's what you have access to. It's what you have time to do. And then what you're interested in, right? I mean, I do find breakfast time for archaeologists on site a- absolutely fascinating. But also, um, I loved this this um, discussion, right? This analysis of what's going on, because these are things I don't really look at, right? Um, and I'm sure several of our colleagues, right, super appreciate the fact that um, somebody is is publishing about these really important things. And so, I do think I should add, you can write about breakfast in really interesting ways. And yeah. what I, really mean, <laughs> I would, didn't take it personally. <laughs> no, what I really mean is there's like this very um, empirical way of doing that sometimes yeah. that I don't think is particularly useful other than just publishing something pretty much straight as it is you know and it, yeah that's the difference and um yeah breakfast can be fascinating <laughs> you know it's very meaningful what people get up to is really interesting but yeah. it's got to, there's got to be some sort of and again I'm not one I think one of the the things with writing a bigger narrative is that there's maybe I know I I sometimes think of of people is you know it has like this sort of provocative title Mm -hmm. like you know you end up making this wide overarching argument but that is something that you come to through years of doing research work the same way anyone else would yeah you sort of and there are nuances to it you try and make them clear um yeah you're not I don't I sometimes worry that you know people are gonna say to me oh you're just damning us all or and that's not really what I think I'm doing what I think I'm doing I hope is providing providing the material to help think about this history usefully yeah for sure um you know it's this stuff is so often roped into these arguments about now now with people saying well it's a different time Mm -hmm. you know you've got to judge I mean that's not really the point of writing history you end up with a sort of checklist checks and whatever the um pluses and minuses approach to history I can't remember what it's called but you know the point is to make people think about what happened yep um you know and how best that might allow them to approach issues they grapple with now in a sense and you know there are there are these huge questions at play here relating to repatriation relating to the place of archaeology in the formerly colonized world etc cetera, etc cetera. and those are really the arguments i think this material can help to address yeah um yeah so I think you're right yeah um well this has been absolutely wonderful we are coming up on time um but is there anything that you want to close out with um, um, um other than buy the book because it's yeah quite buy good. the book there's a 30 percent discount code maybe even a 40 percent one still um <clears throat> i have my twitter or my website um and oh, i'm cool. sure you distribute the details right yes uh-huh yep. um it's yeah please buy it <laughs> <laughs> i'd appreciate it very much there was a lot of uh work that went into it yeah. and uh, i hope it's i think it's a good read i think it is there you go that's yep. a recommendation <laughs> what anyone needs um but no I think you know ultimately I just really want people to think about these big questions using yeah. material that is I think actually directly relevant given the place of the UNESCO campaign in Nubia in the okay. 60s to it's the creation of world heritage right the world heritage convention um comes into being in 1972 or is ratified or whatever it's very unclear how it actually happens no one really knows for sure because there are many many things that go into it but one of the things that have become central to the narrative surrounding it is the UNESCO campaign in Nubia you know which does last for like 20 years it's Mm -hmm. 1960 until 1980 it's this massive series of events um given the centrality of world heritage not necessarily to how 
heritage actually works or how archaeology actually works, but to how like vast numbers of people actually think about how they work. Yeah. And one of the things that comes out of this is that, you know, UNESCO is not an all powerful institution. I think this is like fairly well recognized now, but it's just another example where you can see that like it's there's a really subtle interplay between UNESCO, other institutions, everyone is involved in this. That you know, you can never really give anyone overall agency. Um, yeah. But given that that convention, this series of events are incredibly central to how we think of world heritage. World heritage has also been heavily criticized, you know, over the years, and it was its 50th anniversary around the time the book came out, actually, which is sort of a coincidence. Um, I think it's very useful to like rethink, think through this campaign and its histories and where it came from to think about where we are in the world with this stuff today. And yeah. hopefully that's what the book allows people to do. Um, there you go. Wonderful. Oh, thank you. That was fantastic. Um, that is great. So um, if there's any more questions in the Q&A, I can always send those to Will. Um, and then Stacy is going to pop on to close us out. So hold on. There we go. And yes, thank you so much. That was an absolutely fascinating conversation. And I'm so excited that um, we were able to host you, Will. This was yeah. this was great. I um, appreciate it. I enjoyed it. I so hope everyone I read the, the book. Me too. <laughs> Um, so I don't have a question, but I did just want to mention that some of my research deals with an area of the state of Illinois that was called Egypt or Little Egypt. And, you know, it's it's very much dealing with reception of Egypt and how that plays out in American history and, and identity. And I actually came across this very interesting newspaper editorial from 1965 where a man named Lauren Jeter wanted to petition for the Temple of Dender to be relocated to Southern Illinois. Obviously that didn't happen, uh, but the, the article is very interesting because he tries to tie his last name in with uh, basically biblical history and say wow. how his, his family's surname dates back to the region. Therefore he has some credibility in talking about this and that uh Egypt you know the Egyptians of Illinois which were just you know not actual Egyptians but they called themselves Egyptians would really appreciate having a piece of actual Egyptian history and architecture in southern Illinois geographical spaces I think they're the only ones I mean there's like a <laughs> I think in the book I reference there's an article by David Gisson that talks about how Dendor ends up in the Met ultimately mm -hmm. but I, I just remember like looking in the in UNESCO in their archives and you know there's one town I think I, it's somewhere in California it might even be Palm Springs but it's somewhere a bit like Palm Springs that is petitioning to buy one of these temples <laughs> you know this just happened because because the campaign was so UNESCO had a press machine and worked with its member states um to disseminate this stuff and information basically Info you know unesco is like an information machine on some level mm -hmm. and always was um so you just end up with these sort of requests to just buy these temples have the temples you know whatever we can do to get it mm -hmm. it's very like i think in that case it's like very boosterish you know um yeah so I'm sure it's not, it's not the only one. Yeah, very, very cool. Um, so again, thank you. Uh, we just have two more announcements and then everyone can go and enjoy the rest of their Saturday. Um, just to be aware, we are not going to have an RC Missouri meeting next month in March, but in April, we have the RC annual meeting, which is in Minneapolis. Registration is open already. You can go to rc.org and find out more information about the annual meeting. And then we'll be back with another program in April on the 26th, where we will have Dr. Aidan Dodson, and he will be talking about the tomb of Tutankhamun in context. So we hope to see you at future events, and thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Will. Thank Bye. you.
Bye.